Sonny Webster, welcome to the Without Limits podcast. Thanks, mate. Glad to be here. It's um, it's a fucking pleasure to have you on, man. I know you're running a, a seminar tomorrow at um, our March on Stratford gym. So I was being very opportunistic to ask if you could come on the podcast. And I know you've got a very busy schedule while you're here. So for you to take time out of your day today, it means a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks, mate. I'm looking forward to it. I, uh, I always ask people what does Without Limits mean to them. Uh, I try and give people a bit of a... A bit of help as I, as you start to think about that now, because I know you're going to give me an answer shortly. But for you, the reason why I've brought you on here, one, because I think you're just a fucking fantastic bloke, but also because over the last six, seven years, or since you kind of came on my radar and we've become closer over that time, I see someone who's incredibly hardworking, um, who's hustled to get to where they've where they've got to, has had huge success both in a sporting world, but also in, a, in the business realm. I think you're someone who's always seems happy-go-lucky. Uh, you live life to the fullest from, from what I see. Uh, and I also think there's a level of depth to your being that people don't know, uh, which hopefully we can unpack. So um, you, you're a perfect guest for what this podcast stands for. So what does Without Limits mean to you? Such a, such a good question. A nice place to, I guess, start this chat. Just as you were walking through that then, um, first thing that kind of came to my head when I was trying to think about what was the right answer here, and I don't think there is one, but to me personally, I think without limits, that kind of brought me straight back to thinking about the belief that I've had in myself in terms of my capabilities and what I can achieve from life and what I want from life. And not having limits in your belief, I think plays a huge part in your success in every element that you do or every element of your life. From a very young age, I had the beliefs that I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to have the successes that I've had from a business point of view, from a relationship standpoint. And that all very much came from early beliefs in, in myself. So I think when I think about what without limits really means to me, it's that belief in yourself is what really stops you from having any limits from what you gain from life. Yeah, I mean, it's great. You're someone that, like I say, not many people get to to have Olympic rings tattooed on them for the, for the right reasons because they've been to the Olympics, right? Some people might just do it for for show, but you, you're someone that's going to compete at the Olympics at a young age, you know, in a sport that is, uh, from, from the outside looking in, I've never been a competitive weightlifter, but it looks very isolating. It looks like a tough gig. It looks like the the fruits of your labor. You're not getting paid a tremendous amount of money. You know, it's, it's very much a self-starter and, and, and scraping by to go to the weightlifting clubs and get into the competitions and pay for your travel and things so you, you clearly had, need to have a huge amount of drive to make it particularly at the highest heights of the olympics and then like i say this this kind of second career that you've now had within business uh, a number of different businesses that you've started and uh, had hu huge amount m amounts of success with it so you've touched on a few things that i guess your ca characteristics characteristics and personality traits that have got you to where you are but what would you suggest that your identity is now like who, like who are you because you're a very different person in your weightlifting attire to the person I'm seeing now with the swag and the Rolex. Um, so it's kind of hard to pin down, right? Because you don't see many weightlifters that, that look and act and talk and, and, and have the personality that you do. So who are you, mate? <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I feel like I had an underlying identity far before I ever did Olympic weightlifting. Um, but Olympic weightlifting, I think, was my early vehicle to um, expressing myself. That was one of the first things I noticed when I started Olympic weightlifting was the lack of ability to express who you were in a sport where you get just a number of seconds to, to show everyone what you've been doing in the months, the days, the hours leading up to that experience. And that's one of the beautiful things about Olympic weightlifting. When you stand on that platform and it's just you and that bar, you have that split second to, to show people what you're made of. And... I love that and it's what makes weightlifting so beautiful in my opinion. But through my time as an athlete, I really wanted the ability to express more about who I was and weightlifting never really allowed me to do that. Uh, I pushed the envelope as much as I could with what I wore, the way I dressed, because again, you make an early perception of someone very quickly as, as soon as you see them. And a lot of people would make an early perception of, of me if they looked at me on social media as a clown, someone who wears his hat backwards and, you know, throws bars around. And in a weightlifting environment, you had that few seconds to, to try and express your personality, which is why I think the first thing that 
that I was led to was what I was wearing or the way that I could show who I was. Um, but with that, I think as my confidence grew as an athlete and um, the success came, I guess, from a performance standpoint, weightlifting then started to bring me out of my myself and get me to truly understand a little bit more about what I had to offer this world. And I'm still very protective, I think, of who I share that with. And that's probably why I said a lot of people probably who don't know me personally won't know that side of me. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I think that's one of the beauties of, of life is when you meet someone unwrapping their layers and, and getting to know them. And uh, that's probably why I'm protective of that. But weightlifting was certainly that early vehicle for me. You make weightlifting so much cooler. I think you, you're an absolute credit to to the sport and you make weightlifting cool and you're incredibly passionate about it. So as a young boy, where there's the outlets of many different sports and things, and, and you're, you're obviously quite creative, why did you choose why do you choose weightlifting as a vehicle? Weightlifting was my vehicle because I had a dream of going to the Olympic Games. And I knew before I knew what weightlifting was that that's something that was a burning desire in, in me. And I'm so grateful that I had that at such a young age. When you see people that are you know, older, over the age of 30, 40, 50 years old, and they still don't really know what they want from life or what their purpose is, I knew from a young age, like from 11 years old, that I had a dream of going to the Olympic Games and that's what I wanted to do. So, Had, it, you, seen, had you seen something at the Olympics or what gave you that, that first impression of the Olympics? So that first impression for me, it's quite a funny story because I remember it so, so clearly now. I was sat in a maths class when I was going to this school in Reading in St. Paul's and the PE teacher come running into the classroom and said, look, we need to stop this class and turn the TV on. Uh, something big's about to happen. And the way that the classroom was, it was like three classrooms that were separated by dividing doors. And they pulled open all the dividing doors and all the kids come into this class. And I was like, sweet, don't have to do any maths now. And they flicked on the TV and it was right at the moment where um, David Beckham and Kelly Holmes were jumping up and down and hugging each other. And we had but won the bid to host the 2012 Olympic Games. And I don't know what it was about that moment, but the only thing I can put my finger on was seeing the pure happiness that it brought to David and Kelly to um, be part of the hosting for the Olympic Games. And that feeling and that emotion leapt through the TV at me. And I was like, whatever that is, I want to feel that. And that's why from an early age, the Olympics became such an important factor of, of what I wanted from life. That's that's an impressive story. Um, so with the Olymp, uh, sorry, with the with the weightlifting, I, I heard you you've spoke fondly about Jeff, who's who sat next door. I know he was an early influence on on your, um, I guess, on your weightlifting career, and, and and arguably part of the success that you've had and ability to go and travel around the world to the competitions. So from eleven years old to, to getting to the Olympics, what were the sort of things that you'd have to? the barriers that, that you come up against as a, as a weightlifting athlete? Because I don't suppose there's, there's many places you can go at 11 years old to, to go and become a weightlifter. No, I don't think we've got enough time for all the, uh, all the adversities that, that I've endured in, in that time. But weightlifting was a very, very small sport, like very few sports there is in, well, a lot of the Olympic sports, should I say, especially the minor ones, they don't get the celebration that a lot of major sports do. So I was very closed off to my ability to even find Olympic weightlifting, and I really did find it by chance. Because the school that I moved down to was a sports school in Ivy Bridge called uh, Ivy Bridge Community College, and they just so happened to have a weightlifting club at this uh, school. And the coach there was a lady called Michaela Breeze, um, who was an Olympian herself. And I think, you know, even that, when I was first introduced to Olympic weightlifting, having someone that had already achieved the highest level of the sport introduce it, me to it, set a real, um, I guess, target in terms of what I was capable of. And I think that that's in itself a really important lesson because when you expose yourself to people that have already achieved, you know, great success or the things that you want, it makes that seem like such a easy goal to achieve because look, the person that's teaching you and taking you through everything has been there and done that. So I found that very early on that that was where my target was going to be. It was embedded in me that look, the success as a British weightlifter is to compete in the Olympic Games. And if you can win a Commonwealth gold medal as well, then that's success. 
over that period of time then every waking moment and time even in school was spent weightlifting and pursuing my sport and mastering my craft that's what I did and unlike a lot of kids I think when they start a sport there's distractions of girlfriends of relationships of friendships um, that get in the way and can potentially um, hold to someone's ability to achieve the success that they want. I ignored all of that. And I was prepared to sacrifice a lot of my childhood in order to get what I wanted from life, which was at the time to become an Olympian. I don't get many opportunities to sit down and talk to Olympians. And, you know, I think one thing that people forget when they're in, particularly in sports like CrossFit or functional fitness or go to the gym and do things that involve weightlifting or involve sprinting or involve, I don't know, marathon training, it's, in, it's, it's almost impossible to comprehend what, what the actual elite athletes go to, go to the extents they go to, to, to become elite athletes or compete on those biggest stages. Um, you know, it's like, and I reference this, when I, when I used to do a barbell clean, for example, or do a workout that, that looked like a Metcon, people would be like, oh, when, like the, the naive person would be like, oh, when are you going to go to the games? And they were asking a genuine question because they see me as this authority or someone, this, this elite athlete that's training. And we're talking years ago, but they'd ask questions like that. And it's just a, a lack of genuine understanding for what the elites have to go through and the level that they're at. So at that age, how many hours a week are you putting into to your training and your practice? So in the first couple of years of weightlifting, I was training five times a week for an hour. And I was 11, 12 years old. So that was every single lunchtime um, that I had at school was weightlifting. Uh, very soon on, I was actually starting to split up my training days to training twice a day. So I'd train a little bit before school even or a little bit after school, which was giving me an extra hour. So I was probably close to 10 hours a week, which in comparison to other sports isn't a huge amount if you're into something like you know swimming or gymnastics you put even, even more hours in than that but for the first couple of years that's kind of the time that I was putting in and then from after about four or five years into Olympic weightlifting it was nine sessions a week um, and most of them were two to three hours long. What does it teach you putting that much time and effort into something above above just the skill and becoming better at weightlifting what were you learning at that age outside of actual weightlifting? I think the most important lesson at that age was was discipline. I think building routines at such a young age and dedication to something uh, is incredible. And very early on, having that discipline to go in and train and prioritize my health and my fitness from a very young age allowed things for me further down the line or later in life now, that to be a natural and non-negotiable for me. And that's probably the most valuable lesson that I felt I earned. Yeah, powerful. So, okay, you, you eventually get to the Olympics. What how, what was that feeling like when you get called up and say hey, you got the ticket? Do you know what? The the actual qualification competition for the Olympics was probably from a competitive experience just as valuable as the actual Olympic Games. But when I reflect back on that moment of being on the Olympic platform, and people asked me what that feeling was like. And I don't, I'd asked Olympians time and time again before I'd gone, what's it like to be at the Olympics? Tell me. There's no words to really put into description of what that feeling will feel like. And I think that that's one of the beauties of becoming Olympian because other Olympians can share what that feeling is like. But to tell someone who hasn't been to the Olympic Games, it's difficult. And it, I'd only liken it for someone listening that hasn't been to the Olympic Games. It's probably the same feeling when you have your first child and someone hasn't had kids and they don't know what that sensation would feel like. It's very much like that. But the reason why, for me, it was such an incredible experience in particular was I've competed hundreds and hundreds of times before the Olympic Games. And I'd watched and dreamt about that moment so many times. And it, every time I thought about it before I was there, excitement filled with me, filled, filled me up. But when I actually competed, there was this different sensation that was a whole realm of different emotions all flowing over me at the same time. And I was about to walk out into platform presentation. And my whole life, every high and low, every adversity that I'd been through to get to that point, flashbacks right before my eyes and then I was there and it was an overwhelming feeling of emotion like I almost wanted to cry like I had to hold back tears to go and do that and I'd never felt that before 
in a competition environment because you're going to war when you're competing. You know, it's like everything's going into this moment, but there was this real sense of emotion for for me when I was on that platform. And I think that's why still now when I look down at my tattoo and I always have a smile on my face because it brings back that feeling for me. And I'll never look back at that with with any regret. Is there anything, so you, you mentioned the word regret there. Is How was your performance at the Olympics? Not the best. <laughs> I think absolutely bad. And this is a thing that a lot of British athletes, I think, have to go through, especially in, in Olympic weightlifting. Qualifying's h- the hardest bit. And I put everything into that qualification process to, to put myself in the best shape to qualify. That between that window of qualification and the actual Olympic Games, it was all about just trying to hold my body together at that point. I was on painkillers most days. Um, I was having tramadol for pre-workout pretty much. Most times I was going in the gym. So just to get to the point where I could actually stand that platform and compete was such a big achievement. My performance could have been better. It wasn't terrible. Um, I still lifted within five kilos of my lifetime best, but I would have liked to have made a few more lifts. But Regardless of that, I said to myself before the day, no matter how your body is feeling, what's going on, like you've done everything you can to be in the best shape possible that you can be to compete today, go out there and enjoy it because you're going to have this memory and you may never get this opportunity again. So I made such a point to myself when I was kicking up on that morning of the Olympics to make sure that I really immersed myself in the experience so that I can look back that at that moment for the rest of my life with a smile on my face. So in answer to your question, could it have been better? Yes, but in for me in that personal time, I did everything I wanted to on that platform and loved every minute. How old were you at that stage when you were all those painkillers? Uh, probably around 20 years old. Fuck. Yeah. Again, it just goes back to what people have sacrificed to, to be at the highest heights of sport. Um, are you suggesting then, so in that in that qualification process you're, you're basically peaking because it's so hard to qualify that that's that's kind of your olympic games to, and you have to put it all on the line yeah you think in in most sports or in sports probably where um qualify like if you're the best in the world at, at your sport you're ta- you're not even tapering for qualification events you're already qualified the eyes can be on the prize of being in the best shape possible for the actual Olympics. But with the qualification process being so difficult in Olympic weightlifting, the chances of us getting a spot, and we only got one spot for men uh, at the 2016 Olympic Games, it was a battle to see who was gonna go out of that, out of the, out of the men. So um, for most other sports people, I think they would actually peak for the actual Olympic event um, rather than the qualifying, but that's the way it is in this country. What, what could you have done better or differently to have to have made it more a more seamless pro- is it just strength technique more more years in the sport i think genetics as an athlete you're only exposed to the experiences that you're exposed to so it's almost like you're flying a little bit in the dark and like on reflection it's easy to reflect but at the time i made all the decisions that were right for me at that given moment um you can't prepare the body very easily or the mind for what it's like to compete in Olympic Games. If you're an athlete that has done multiple Olympic Games and if, who knows, I was ever to compete in the Olympic Games again, my understanding from previous experience would be so much better as to what I would do. And I would think I would make sure that I was a hell of a lot better so that I wouldn't have to go so hard in the qualification event to be in good shape for the Olympics. But that still doesn't account for the psychological things that you have to deal with from an experience standpoint when you're in the Olympic Games. Because in a sport like weightlifting that has no coverage, like I've competed in the world championships and there was one person in the crowd fucking hoovering while I was competing, you know, that's my world championships. If you're in the world championships in athletics, you've been in a stadium full of people round, round the track. It's normal at the Olympics. So for, for a weightlifter, it's really hard to predispose yourself to what that is like from a competitive environment standpoint. And it's like no other competition in the world. Not even the Commonwealth Games compares to, to the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, okay, so post-Olympics, um, were you still involved with weightlifting beyond that? Yeah, I, I was for a couple of years uh, post-Olympics from a, uh, from a competitive standpoint. Uh, My goal was always post-Olympics to go up to the um, Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, and that was going to be my 
gold medal attempt and then it was retire. So I already had a clear understanding that once I ticked off these two things that I wanted to do, that would be my point of, of retirement after then. And more than anything, it's because I knew I wanted more from life than just to, to be a weightlifter. Um, like I said, it comes back to the first thing we kind of spoke about in terms of what my identity was. I felt like there's so much more that I can I can do and so much more uh, that I can give this world, I guess, than, than just being the weightlifter. As a young kid, when you dream about be, being an Olympic athlete and you get it at 20 years old, some people would go, I want to taste of that again. I want to keep, keep going back, keep going back. Is it because you wanted to express yourself in other ways or what gives you that perspective to go, actually, I'm going to try and tick this off over the next couple of years, get the Commonwealth Games and then move on? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think one thing that I've learned probably only in the last year or two of my life is that you just have to accept things for, for what they are and you know accept the happiness and the enjoyment that you get from the experience for what it was. And sometimes hanging on to something, whether it be a sport or an achievement, and let that be your identity, it prevents you from continuing to grow. And for me, weightlifting, I look at it like a, a chapter in my book. And it was the going to the Olympic Games was the first chapter in my book. But I've got so many more chapters that I want to write. And if I continued to hang on to that and let that be the only thing that defined me, I would have never been able to write the rest of the book. So... I think then from an acceptance standpoint, that's what really what I've done. I've just had to put that side of competitive sunny. And don't get me wrong, that fire still burns every now and then. I still feel that urge to want to come back and, and do that. But that's what really brings you back to understanding, okay, what is the, what's the real meaning behind what you're doing? Do I need that for personal gratification? Do I need that to prove to myself that I'm still an amazing athlete. I don't need that for myself anymore. And if you don't truly know the purpose behind why you're doing what you're doing, then you shouldn't be doing it, you know? And you can have as many internal battles and conversations as you want, but you ultimately have to arrive at that answer. I, I heard your podcast with James Smith, which was the, the first where you spoke about your, your ban. Um, so I know that the opportunity to maybe compete was ripped away from you. A seven year ban is pretty harsh to, to deal to someone. And I know that the, the repercussions of the ban was was far beyond your ability to just compete. I mean, they came after your livelihood in many different ways. And I don't really want to go too far down that rabbit hole because I think you did a fantastic job on that podcast of explaining everything. But so when you do get served the ban, what are you thinking there in terms of livelihood, future, career? Uh, yeah, it's it's di a difficult one even like to to think back on because at the moment, at the time when that happened, it was like my whole world fell apart. And I know people have used that terminology before, but it comes back to what I was saying about identity. My whole identity was built around um, being a weightlifter. And it wasn't about the fact that I couldn't compete again that was most hurtful. It was the fact that there was people out there and people out there that will probably think that I didn't achieve what I achieved through my own hard work. And that was probably the hardest thing to, to stomach. You know, on reflection now, after everything that I've been through and I've come out the other side, like bad times, like, you know, hard times, they, they do pass. And you can start to, I guess, reflect on things much clearly as, as time, time heals you. I got really good after that period of my life in being able to draw a line in the sand and be able to move forward. And I think that, Coming back from, you know, what was the lowest and the hardest part of my life, it gave me the opportunity that I really needed probably a year or two earlier than it was going to happen to rebuild myself and work out who I was again at that point in my life. Yeah, I mean, when I look at it, I think there's there's a number of people that have gone to Olympics, hundreds of people have gone to Olympics and stood on that platform and did what you did. I see very few people that have gone on to build the personal brand, the reputation, the businesses, the credibility help hundreds of thousands of people through your coaching. So it suggests that there's a lot of evidence that there's a huge spark in who you are compared to who everyone else is. Uh, and I know that, that, you know, that the early period, like I say, beyond the band would have been incredibly difficult and, and surely the hardest times of your life. But I remember this was around the sort of time I was coming across you more and more and more. I remember watching that kind of journey and, the, and you started to travel and you started to, to explore different um, roots with your with your career beyond um, weightlifting and this new identity for you. So at that sort of stage, 
what were the ideas that you were coming up with? And I think, you know, we could talk forever about weightlifting and you know, weightlifting is obviously a huge part of who you are and what your businesses are now, but there's a, there's an entrepreneur and a business owner and someone with a, with a competitive edge away from the platform as well. What were the things you were, you were calling on or the levers you were pulling on to, to decide what this next step would be? Why, why coaching? Why starting a clothing company? Why mobility? Why all these things? I think just even taking a step back there, just coming back to the adversity thing, because I think that's a really important part of the, the story or the journey that kind of propels anyone. I've never met a successful person that hasn't in their own realm, I guess, experienced an element of adversity. And I think that that's what really allows you to, like I said, come back to finding out who you are. It allowed me to really look inside myself and say, okay, well, well what am I passionate about? What else can I can I offer and at the end of the day weightlifting has always been that huge part of my life and always was it's everything that I know I've lived and breathed it for for so many years I had a passion for that sport that I wanted to share with other people and the natural progression on from that low point was to I guess find my happiness again back through doing what I was doing but give people the same feeling the same happiness that I get from weightlifting and I know we're talking about weightlifting a lot here, but weightlifting as it's in its core is such an old school dated sport with very little passion behind it that is visible. CrossFit was very helpful to Olympic weightlifting to start to expose the sport. But for me, when I thought about what can I do to make weightlifting cool, <laughs> it was I guess putting my personality and my twist on modernizing what the sport was. Because the type of person that was now gets into Olympic weightlifting isn't the 11-year-old kid that wants to go to the Olympic Games. The type of person that gets into Olympic weightlifting is the 20 to 30-year-old, the 40 to 50-year-old that goes, hey, I want to do a sport that's going to challenge me, a sport that I can never complete, a sport that's going to give me longevity, great movement, and feel strong and healthy. And I needed to modernize the learning process so that that was something that weightlifting was able to do. And that's what really born the, the lifting zone. It was my way of being able to refresh the dated methodology and the teaching methods of Olympic weightlifting. So it spoke to the modern day person that could utilize the sport. I mean, you're a rugby player, you would have used weightlifting movements right at the start of your career. And lots of people do because it's an amazing form of exercise, but it never had, uh, never had the legs of other sports. Yeah, it was this. It was almost as the perfect kind of inflection point of like the rise of, of CrossFit and people getting into weightlifting and obviously come up against the, the sticking points, the skill acquisition, the strength, the know-how. Um, and then you enter the the, the the chat with this enthusiastic, passionate, charismatic um, product and seminar. That, I think that's how I first came across you. I came to yeah. a Sunny Webster seminar in I think 2018. Uh, we just started the original March on Gym. And Olympic weightlifting had a bit of an influence on the way we trained at the time. Um, we'd obviously done a lot within within rugby, but we were starting to now use it within our within our fitness and, and programming. So we came across the St Albans, and that's where we first met you. And I think that's, like I said, your your personality and character your uh, character just just shone through. And I think that's why CrossFitters or people in those CrossFit communities have have adopted you kind of into their circle so well. But not everyone adopted you in right that almost people from your previous life began to make things difficult for you again. Would, th would that be fair to say? Yeah, for sure. And I think that the, just coming back to the point you made there about, you know, with CrossFit and starting to utilize the Olympic weightlifting movements, the barrier to entry in Olympic weightlifting is extremely high because of the, the skill acquisition that you need to have, the range of motion that you need to have to perform the sport correctly, which is ultimately, I guess, what I had to break down when um, I wanted to, I guess, improve the learning process of the sport um, was to make it more accessible to the masses. And that's really something that, that I've always pushed and something that I pushed with my seminars and pushed with my teaching methodology. Um, but yeah, of course, there's, there's, I think when anyone reaches a certain level um, of success or someone's trying to step out of the norm in their processes, in their principles, uh, it ruffles people's feathers because people don't like change and they don't like people, I guess, um, doing things a different way. But I was prepared to stick my neck on, my, on the line to, to push through that barrier for the benefit of so many more people. 
because as time passes, you can start to see more and more athletes now, more weightlifters putting themselves out there, creating personal brands for themselves, because arguably I was the one who kicked down the walls in those early stages to be like, this is something that is possible for us as weightlifters. And they may not have appreciated at the time, and they were the ones that were probably um, bad-mouthing me, trying to make things difficult for me at the time. But I think as years pass, they'll look back on what I did and think that, you know, actually maybe maybe what Sonny was doing was the right thing. And people do change their minds. Yeah, I think there's, I remember there was a lot of people from the, from the purest weightlifting world almost shunning CrossFitters trying to do weightlifting within, within the modality, right? Mm-hmm. And you taking a, yeah, a fairly prehistoric kind of sport with outdated, uh, yeah, out, just it was just outdated. It wasn't cool. It wasn't relevant. It wasn't. It wasn't. You wouldn't. You weren't getting probably many more eleven-year-olds wanting to take it up, particularly in this country. They were going straight into things like CrossFit, um, and I think you made it cool and accessible for people. So, more power to you for that, mate. I think on that as well. Like that, this is the the thing where a lot of weightlifters, like when you spoke about CrossFitters or even anyone that picks up Olympic weightlifting, if I was to go and get a piano now and play you a song, I'm going to hurt your ears because I'm not very good at it. But I think a lot of weightlifters thought that CrossFitters should be great overnight without any good coaching and because they were just doing the movements. But like anything that we do, it takes years and years to master a craft. And I think weightlifters forget because of uh, classical Olympic weightlifters, if you like, or old school weightlifters forget because they started at 11 years old. They're very forgetful of the, um, I guess, the difficulty of learning a sport. It's much easier when you're younger than it's when you're older anyway but that's the one thing that I think in my teaching process that I always try and take myself back to okay when I'm trying to teach someone how to snatch 100 kilos I did that when I was 14 years old so I need to take myself back to 14 year old Sonny and how did I go about achieving that goal then and a lot of people didn't take that into account when they saw people doing weightlifting bad Instead, they were just horrified to see our purest, beautiful snatch and clean and jerk movements, like bastified, I guess, in uh, in practice. But it's part of the process, you know. And I was there to stand in and and help people take that leap. For people that don't have or haven't had the opportunity yet to come to one of your seminars or, or I don't know, sign up to Lifting Zone, what do you think the the biggest mistakes for people? I mean, CrossFit's probably the biggest use case of weightlifting now where people will get exposed to Olympic weightlifting um, or even some of these functional fitness competitions that are coming along. What would be the, I don't know, your top three or top five things for someone to consider if they're going to a CrossFit box, they're always having to do the scaled version, it's not quite working out for them, they're getting frustrated um, because Olympic weightlifting can be very frustrating and they might not be getting the coaching or the attention to detail that they would get if they came to a seminar or on one of your programs. What would you suggest that they they focus on? Yeah, I was actually thinking about this the other day, and I'm always thinking about the struggles that people have when they when they get into Olympic weightlifting. And yeah, you're right. A lot of people do come in the door through CrossFit and then find weightlifting. I think one of the hardest things, and you may be even able to give me an insight on this as a gym owner, when people come in the door and they join a gym, the thing that they want to do is feel like they belong as quickly as possible. So that means that they want to get into classes and be involved in what everyone else is doing so that they can begin their journey and crack on. If a class is using something that is so technical like an Olympic weightlifting movement and they get thrown into the class, what the coach then has to do is fast track that learning process for them to make them feel included very quickly. So I've answered the question, I guess, in a roundabout kind of way, but don't let that process at the start be rushed because if you struggle with the mobility or to get into the positions that are required of you in Olympic weightlifting, you need to address that first before you even think about worrying about a snatch and clean and jerk. And this is where I think a screening process is extremely important when, you know, someone's joining a gym and if you're, you you know, you're thinking about, okay, what exercises do I want to do? These are things that are involved in the class or I want to do CrossFit. Actually understanding, okay, what can my body do right now? What can't it do? Addressing that first, and it doesn't need to be that long. You can spend six to eight weeks spending time mobilizing and building a good foundation of strength and understanding how your body moves if you haven't worked out for 10 years and then be put into a class environment and that learning process will be way easier. 
The second thing I see a lot is when people are picking up weightlifting later in life, you're not limited by your strength. So again, a lot of the time people will let their te technique break down until the point that they'll never actually get to utilize the strength that they can. So what I would say, I guess, is my second point would be to make sure that your limiting factor or the point in which you're deciding where your ceiling is for the moment, should we say, is based around your technique breaking down. So that technique is always the leading point. Technique and being in control of where the bar is in relation to your body. And again, I think the reason why people struggle with this a lot is because when you watch weightlifting done uh, at its best, it's extremely fast, it's extremely explosive. And people try to rec replicate the mastery of the sport rather than if you watched me when I first started Olympic weightlifting with the PVC pipe, just doing that and focusing on barbell movement and technique, that's what needs to be replicated. Um, and, th and then finally, there is no substitute to having a really good structure and plan from an early day. I think if you're going into the gym and even if your goal is to just have longevity um, from your training, understand what is what is that longevity? Does that mean that to you longevity means that you want to be able to have a full range motion squat with your body weight so that you can play with your kids and get into all the weird and wonderful positions you need to, et cetera, to do so? Understand what the end result is and have a clear process and a clear journey of how you're going to achieve that and then maintain it. Because I'm super big on like being deliberate when you're training. And a lot of people go into the gym, they go through the movements and you go, so why are you here? What are you doing? Uh, I don't know. I just get out of the house for an hour, get away from the missus. I'm just trying to get a sweat on. You need to have a goal of some respect and a clear process so that when you're going into the gym you know why you're there and you can train with intent and i think everyone needs that early doors in olympic weightlifting whether the goal is to snatch your body weight or to break a world record you know i suppose it's probably quite difficult to answer but let's say someone is just looking for longevity in, in the in the true sense of it so preserving their body movement uh getting stronger getting a little bit fitter and be and wanting just to go to the gym and feel better about themselves how much relevance, and I know you're going to have a slightly biased view, but how much relevance does weightlifting have or, or, or a percentage of time spent should be allocated towards weightlifting? Yeah, it's a good question because I think a lot of people will avoid utilizing the more challenging movements like the snatch um, in training. If the goal is ultimately to, to build longevity, then do you need to be doing a snatch and clean and jerk? Can it be achieved with other movements? Yes, but I think one of the beauties that Olympic weightlifting has is the technical aspect, which is it keeps people very, I guess, engaged in the learning process and the challenge of that particular movement. And you're also moving through a full range of motion when you're doing any of the classical movements and getting a full body workout, essentially, which I think is amazing if you can utilize those movements. Is it going to suit everyone? Absolutely not. But it depends, I guess, it comes back to that time frame. If the goal is that you want to have longevity, utilizing Olympic weightlifting movements maybe after one or two years of building a great foundation of strength in the squatting, pulling movements and basic modalities of exercise, and you go, okay, I'm looking for a little bit more of a challenge here. Great, why don't we start incorporating some cleans? as a nice barrier to entry easy. Okay, you've already got great stability and strength in the overhead movements, in the pressing movements. Why don't we try and do something a little bit more dynamic like the jerk? Because you can't replace that explosive power with load with anything else. Weightlifting wins in that respect. Yeah, I, I th that's such a great point. And I'm glad you kind of articulated that way because I think we find it with our gyms as a gym owner. I think there's a given time where someone can eke out all the benefits they need from traditional kind of strength training. Uh, but it gets to a point where they're going to start to plateau because of the stuff that they're doing outside the gym or not doing outside the gym. They can't organize their life around sleep, nutrient timing, recovery, um, whatever it may be so that you know their strength, they, this kind of hit their ceiling. But what, what we can do with someone like that is begin to challenge them from a skill demand perspective. And that's where you see things like teaching someone how to uh, kip, teaching someone how to do a power clean from the hang position and start to layer it on from there. But I guess where it's been, th that learning rate has been forcibly accelerated ha is in group fitness, group exercise. I don't want to just bash CrossFit, but in CrossFit classes where what's on the board is usually some sort of barbell piece 
with Olympic weightlifting or gymnastics. And most people find themselves having to get a PVC pipe and scaling it without ever being given the progressions. And if you've got an hour, three hours to train each week, and you're not getting any sufficient load through your body because you're constantly working on technique bars and, and practicing technique, you're not getting any adaptation from a strength perspective, um, maybe from a, from a skill perspective, but I'd also question that with the coaching that goes on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it comes back, I'm thinking about this again from, from my personal experience, like I can do a limpid way of thing with, with my eyes closed from a technical aspect that does not challenge me because I've done it for so long, but I've just started running. And the enjoyment that I'm getting, I'm re I guess, uh, acquainting myself with what it feels like to be challenged in a, in a new area or something that I haven't, I'm not very good at at all. And I'm loving going out for a run and struggling and that learning process of getting better at running. And again, when I think about why do I love training, like challenging myself from a technical aspect is one of the things that I enjoy the most. And uh, learning a new skill or learning a new exercise like I am with running is a massive part of why I love training, you know. And again, it comes back to what I just said about being such an important part of anyone's journey in health and fitness. It's like, why do you do what you do? Why do you go into the gym? Do you go into the gym because you love community and you want to make friends? You're probably going to go for classes. Are you going into the gym because um, you want to build strength and discover a new technique then you're probably going to have pt and learn something challenging like olympic weightlifting so i think it's always bearing that in mind like but ultimately even as an elite level athlete i train for enjoyment and that's something that's super important to factor into this as well and a lot of people gain a hell of a lot of enjoyment from from learning the sport of weightlifting this is a bit of a segue so let's not labor on it but how far off are you right now from the elite level at your age and weight and whatever else is comes into it my lifetime best snatch is 160 and 200 clean and jerk and at the moment i'm at 155 190 so i'm there or thereabouts as good as i i was um seven years ago could i compete at the olympic games uh again probably if i went through the qualification process could i win the british and be the best in the country again yes like that is something that's well within my capabilities We'll park that for the time being. Um, you talk, like I said, I referenced earlier, incredibly passionately about weightlifting things. There'll be a number of listeners that are gym owners, personal trainers, coaches, um, business owners of sorts. How did you start to build this business? I know you said, you know, that that kind of rebounding back from your, from your lowest lows, the vision or, or intent just to be happier, you know, follow a passion around, around, around Olympic weightlifting, sharing that with an audience that needed it, CrossFit ordinarily or primarily seminars and things. I remember coming across you and thinking, this guy's on a bit of a, he's on a bit of, he's got some momentum behind him. Um, you were doing the seminars, you were starting to travel. Like I said, you were going across to, to Australia, Bali and a few different places. What was it? What were those sort of early kind of principles that you were applying to now trying to monetize this and build a business around the lifting zone? Was that, or, or it was Sunny Webster Academy at the time. Was that the, yeah. was that the first iteration of, of, your, of your business life? Yeah, yeah, it was. Well, other than selling golf clubs when I was a kid, <laughs> that's another story. Um, yes, it was was the early stages. And I guess I'm going to just explain, I guess, a principle of what social media was to me when I, when I first started, because I think that's a tool now that everyone uses. And I was quite an early adopter, I guess, to Instagram. You were very um, much an early adopter, yeah. Yeah. And everything that I did when I would post or create a video was to create um, – a reaction or to reach new people being the most important thing. I know if I do a crazy lift with a barbell, it's going to blow up. I'm going to reach new people. Everything that I was doing from an early stage to build my personal brand and who I was, was about reaching more people. And I had a very particular IP that no one else had because I can do some crazy shit with the bar. So I lent into that a lot to kind of reach more people. And the bigger I could grow my audience, the more I could then um, translate people interested in weightlifting to then converting those types of people to paying customers or people that wanted my services, which is why it's almost like a filtration system in terms of having audience come in, watch me do something crazy, and then, oh, okay, he teaches too. And then I'm narrowing them down my funnel to then 
building enough trust with the person and I guess them understanding my knowledge and depth in Olympic way of thing to then go, okay, I'd like to pay this guy for services. So that in itself is a very early principle, I guess, of how my business was structured just purely through social media. Were you thinking about personal brand back then? Um, because anyone maybe in your shoes would be like, I'm just going to bury my head in the sand for, for a period of time. <laughs> I don't think I was thinking necessarily about personal brand. I think that's what it's called now. But I think I was displaying, um, I guess, traits of what building a personal brand is and i didn't know it then um i studied sports performance at olympic weight for four years so i was already well studied in in my area of of sport and that's why it was about feeding out i guess the educational um, elements of what i was doing but there's another layer to that where once you've reached as many people from an online per point of view collaborating and engaging with other people and in different parts of the world was the natural next step to build an audience. And I see this a lot and I catch myself and remind myself to get back on the road as I'm doing now very regularly because that's what continues to help you grow and stay relevant in the early stages of, of business. But I was doing collaborations before collaboration was a word. I'd go and find someone that had another big audience in Olympic weightlifting or not really an Olympic weightlifting, but in another sport, whether it be CrossFit or something like that. And I'd make an extended effort to go and train with that person and create content because there's a lot of value as well um, to be gained from who you align yourself with and the types of people you align yourself with. Because if no one knows um, you, for example, and I have a chat with you, but they have a lot of respect for me, all of a sudden, that is carried over because, well, if Sonny respects Ollie, then I reckon he's probably going to be a really good guy. And that in, in essence is what you do, I suppose, when you're collaborating and meeting people. And I made such an effort to do that in the early stages to, to build my network as it were. Um, and to, I guess, add social proof to, to what I was doing, which is why I had such involvement with multiple, uh, games athletes. It's such a, a topical thing. I actually just recorded a podcast earlier on today where we're, I was talking about that ability to, there's always got to be an exchange of value, right? Between between people. But once you've exchanged value with someone, they're always willing to introduce you to the next person. And and this kind of collaboration and networking thing begins to self kind of you know, pet, perpetuate itself. Um, one thing that I was tasked with this year, and I've kind of seen it with getting out to see George represent and a few other, you, you do see that, your, the eyeballs on you when you're doing cool things out of the, the usual kind of um, repetitiveness of day to day begins to grow. There's more people are watching, people get a little bit more nosy and, it, and this, this kind of traction begins to occur. Um, so you saying it there actually reminds me that that was, that was something I was tasked with this year, but it becomes a little bit more harder when you've, when you've got a wife and kids and, and things to be here. So what were the things that, you know, it seemed, I referenced earlier, you were a happy-go-lucky type of dude. You just sort of upped and left and, and went halfway across, the, well, all the way across the world. Most people see that as being a barrier, right? A big barrier and they put limitations on themselves. Like, how did you get yourself into a place where you were happy just to up, up and go? I think, you know, and to get you to understand the feeling, when you surround yourself with the likes of George or other industry leaders, your creative brain goes on overdrive because you're now around other successful people that make you want to go away and again, take things up another level. And that energy you get from being around uh, in new environments and around new people, you can't replace. And that's really what I felt when I first started to travel and I went over to Australia, I felt a new level of creative energy. When I was first over there, I was surrounded by James Smith and Deeran, We'd wake up at uh, six in the morning, go to the coffee shop, and we'd be there writing sales emails. Before, Sonny would wake up at like eight and go to the gym. But surrounding myself in this new environment with these new people was like, okay, I need to step this up. This is what I'm going to do. And that's what I guess stemmed the want to, to um, move. Aside of meeting my um, old partner at the time, I wanted to be in a new place where I could be creative again and take things up another notch. And environment is so crucial when you're trying to do that. And 
I'm just entering now that next click, I guess, in, in my life where I'm feeling, okay, this is my next step for my new environment to take things up that next notch. And that's what really stemmed that that want to change. But is it scary? Yes. But um, again, it also provides a whole new amount of opportunities that you never would have pre-exposed yourself to. When I think about decision making like that, I always think, well, what's the worst that could happen? If it all goes tits up, I move back in. But at least I know. Yeah, I mean, I always work, but that's, it's exactly how my brain works when we're making big decisions. It's like work back from like worst case scenario, which will never happen because of the, the due diligence you've done, your skill set, your expertise. You know that worst case isn't going to happen, but if you can sc- stomach worst case, then it's, it's worth the punt. I mean, watching you move to Australia was something I was so fond of. And I remember the early days of you, James and Deering, and you get this kind of like this FOMO feeling of it just looks, uh, the grass always looks green on the, on the other side, right? But Australia, although I've never been, has this huge place in my heart because of the way people talk about it, the lifestyle looks conducive with everything that you know I'm interested in. Um, the weather, the coffee, the food, the brunch. What, uh, what is it, what is it, what was it like for you moving over there besides, I guess, the network of people you're with? What's it like compared to the UK? It was actually very lonely at the start. Um, I didn't have any like core friendship group um, or where my where my gym was going to be, where I was going to train. I was floating. I had um, my ex partner that I was with, but she also had her own own life and her own friends and routine. So I felt very lost in um, that first period of when I moved there because I didn't really felt like I belonged anywhere mm-hmm. and. At the time, even with that, uh, James was over there and I was spending time with him, but he also had his own routine and what he was doing. And it took me a while to, I guess, build my own identity in that space and to stop relying on other people, I guess, to to be well, for my own personal happiness in, in what I was doing. So it was actually much lonelier than um, I thought it was going to be or pay, maybe even what people potentially perceived. Um, at the start and um, but it very quickly I guess gives you that appreciation that you can't rely on like I said the the surroundings the place you are for your happiness and I've now traveled all over the world and I constantly remind myself that like it's not where you are that is making you happy it's everything else about that environment and what's going on in your life that is truly giving you happiness and I think that brings you then a lot more internally thinking about what's important to you on a daily basis. Yeah, you spoke before we started recording about the the need for routine because you're doing a lot of traveling. And obviously as an 11 year old kid going to the gym five days a week, then nine times a week, whatever it was, you're building this discipline, these routines. What part, because you, you live a lovely lifestyle that now, right? And it's very easy for you to to veer away from the things that, that keep you well grounded in routine. I'm guessing it's things like the sun exposure, the eating well, um, what what part does routine play, or what part does routine play in your life right now? And how do you how do you manage routine when you're doing so much traveling? Yeah, I think that there's there's core non non negotiables in in a day for for me. Training is one of them. I, I love to train; it makes me feel good. That doesn't necessarily mean I need to go and do Olympic weightlifting. And that's part of the reason why I've started just running recently because that's something that you can do anywhere. And I can go out and feel like I get an element of exercise. So that's that's a non-negotiable for me. I changed my lifestyle, I guess, and structure of my day just very recently to give myself my first hour of the day to myself. And that had a huge impact on, on me where I have an hour to, um, I guess, think about how I feel about myself at a given moment, what thoughts are in my head, what do I want to achieve in that given day. Um, I love to listen to an audio book um, in my first part of the day and just let myself really wake up. So that's a real non-negotiable for me um, in a given day. And then the other thing that I've paid a lot more uh, attention to is, yeah, of course, sun exposure is lovely, not easy in the UK. um, And sleeping routine is, is also super important. But with that, it can be very hard to try to do that every single day when you're traveling and you can sometimes very easily get stuck is that if you break that routine or it doesn't happen on a given day you failed and this is where i like to break up like my year is in okay there's six months six weeks before i come away here 
I'm in my office and I've absolutely shafted from like 5 a.m. till super late. And that's been my hustle six weeks. I worked super hard before I came away here. I knew this next couple of months was going to be about, um, after my training camp in Bali, was going to be about traveling. I've got planned enjoyment next week where I've got a week off work to enjoy time with my best friend. And it comes back to that, I guess, balance outside of just the work hustle and the training hustle to reward yourself almost for the hard work that you do too because else you're gonna have to sit and ask yourself like why the hell am i doing all this you've got such an, uh, a mature head on your shoulders and it's something that i actually spoke about this last night with my cousin he came to see me we were talking about our own mortality of all topics um and i've been doing a lot of thinking i referenced it on a podcast a few weeks ago with sam just about like what uh, what brings me enjoyment and my real purpose right now around the things that I'm interested in, you know, obviously business being a key, key part of it, my own athletic endeavors and myself as a, as a father. And it's, it's hard to sometimes stop and go, what am I doing this all for? And how much is enough? And, um, you know, is, is the current routine that I've got optimized for what I'm trying to achieve? How do you sit and reflect on, on personal happiness? I know you said you got that hour in the morning of the day, but is, is there any sort of key things that you've, you've lent on? Because at 30 years old, when you, I think you are, I think you are a great example of someone who's built personal brand, who's incredibly studied and experienced in your, in your, um, your field with Olympic weightlifting, but you get this balance, you seem to get this balance of work-life balance really well and you enjoy the fine things in life. How's that, how's that happen? Is you doing a lot of self-reflection? Yeah, I, I do a lot. And I think that for me, it's only something that's happened since I've turned 30 to be able to be really introspective and more than anything to be able to sit with my own thoughts. And it's, it's easier said than done when people talk about meditation and being able to sit and, and think, but everyone has their own way in which they wanna meditate. But for me, that to me means to be able to sit and really think about how I'm feeling about something and how I internally feel and how external factors are impacting my mood and my happiness. But I think happiness, changes from person to person and again james smith taught me a very valuable lesson early on in my life the difference between happiness and pleasure and it's really important to understand that um and the things that i do that may be yeah, quite extravagant or the finer things in life as they would be referred to as that brings me an element of uh, happiness oh sorry pleasure but happiness to me and what's really making me most happy at the moment is new experiences and being around new people. I love to be in a feeling that I've never felt before. And that's something that I'm really leaning into. And when you're reflective, you can do that. You can understand what's made the last 24 hours of my day so great. What did I do? I experienced someone new. I met a new person. I love good conversation. It's the thing that fills my cup more than anything. We live in a world where we're distracted so often that for you to have a 20 minute conversation with someone without being interrupted or without, you know, something ruining that conversation, it's very, very rare. And I think one of the beauties of life is being able to get into a point where you can have a conversation on, on this level where you can really dive into understanding about how someone feels about something. Like I said, peeling back the layers of, of someone and getting to know them. And that for me at the moment is, is the beauty of life. And I'm fortunate that I can do that on my travels while I, while I do what I do. But um, I guess that's what's important to me right now. It begs the question, though, because you've got Lifting Zone, you've gone on to build uh, Big Friday Supplies, uh, the app Mobility Manual. I know we were talking just before, you've got an SEO company. What's the, what's the goal with all of this? Have you worked backwards from, you know, because something people always encourage me, to, like, what's the exit strategy? Where, where are you trying to take this to? What's the intention? Do you ever think about that or are you just kind of going with it, having fun whilst doing it and then you'll course correct when something's not, not enjoyable? I'm always thinking about it. And I think, you know, I'm big on being able to, like I said to you earlier, just accept, accept things for what they are. And for me, if what I do with Big Friday Supplies, all that is at the moment is that tickles Sonny's like creative brain because I get to create and make things and, and draw and it make, brings people happiness. Then, then great. But my sole purpose around what I do from a clothing aspect is about me getting to put my creative outlet out there. 
everything that I do from a, a lifting zone standpoint is leaving my legacy on being able to change the way that people perceive the sport of Olympic weightlifting, but make it accessible to the masses. I know that's why I do what I do. And the lifting zone is that vehicle. Mobility for me is the biggest stumbling block for people when it comes to um, having access to my beautiful sport of Olympic weightlifting. And that's why I have the mobility manual. So with everything that I do from a, from a business standpoint, it's tickling a personal, I guess, motivation for myself. I'm just so fortunate that when I want something and um, when I want to tickle a scratch and itch, as it, as it were, I create the business and build it around, around me and what I want, which I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I have. But it also means that I need people like Jeff in my life, who is extremely business savvy, business savvy. He is one of the smartest blokes that, that I've ever been around, but from not only from a, from a business standpoint, but from a, a mentorship standpoint as well, to allow me to focus my energy on, on what I'm good at. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be messing around with accounts and HR side of things or anything else that doesn't make me tick. I have a great team of people around me so that I can focus my energy on what I'm good at. Don't get me wrong, I still have days where I have to sit and do emails and do things I don't like to do. But I try and limit that as much as possible in what I'm doing so that I can do the things that make me happy. I mean, there's so many par parallels to everything you've just said there. And actually, got I've got Jeff in my notes. I mean, we touched on him and his kind of influence on you getting to the Olympics in the early days. But fast forward to where we are now I know he's kind of like your sidekick and I know he he fondly gets over to see you in Australia and Bali what what impact does having I mean you, you kind of you kind of said it already but what imp impact does having that that person that's very close to you or, or an inner circle or a team how's that allowed you to to uh do the things that you're you're your genius and also what are the sorts of things that you're that you're looking for when you're bringing people into your team I'm going to talk about team I guess as my friendship group as well, because I think that they're to a degree they align. And I think I don't have a big friendship group, but the people that I have around me, the mentors that I have and the people that I look, look up to, I think one of the most important factors around those types of people in your life is having someone that can be really real and honest with you. And I think you need that in your life to be able to make sure that the direction that you're heading in is right. And especially when you're battling with your own ego at times, it can be very difficult to self-critique that. Whereas having important people in your life like Jeff for, for a guidance, for a, um, a sound barrier, if you like, um, to, I guess, add validation to your thoughts, help you understand why you feel the way you feel um, can be super powerful. But in addition to that, there's a lot of experience that is gained by having key members of staff, key friendships around you because if you really invest in getting to know the per people that are close to you they've experienced things that you're about to experience they've gained life lessons from things that that you want to do and you can save yourself a lot of time a lot of heartache um, a lot of adversity if you can absorb knowledge from the people that are closest to you that's what I do with Jeff. He's got a lot more life in him than me. I won't tell you how old he is because he looks amazing <laughs> for his age. But he's experienced so much more life than, you know, than, than I have. And I'm very fortunate the fact that he's always there and wanting to share. And again, him, like a lot of my friends, everyone that's close to me, they all want the best for me. We want the best for people closest to us. You know, and if someone that's around you doesn't want the best for you, then they're probably not a really true friend. And that's what a good team member is and a good friendship is, is if you've got someone around you that truly wants the best for you, you know you're always going to get that honesty from them, learn the lessons that you need to from them, and they'll be grateful to share because there's nothing better than being able to save someone <laughs> a couple of years of their life with a couple of lessons that you learn. Yeah, I mean, it's such a powerful duo, you and Jeff, and it's so... It's um it's inspiring the way you speak of each other and I've I've like I said I've listened to to early podcasts that you've been on and the way in which you talk about him and having got to meet him um I think you guys took me for dinner a couple of years ago in London yeah he's sure. a he's a special character I've got a couple other bits just just to touch on I think you seminars is one thing that you became really popular for and they're fantastic training camps is something that I think you do incredibly well 
Have, do you have plans to take it anywhere beyond Bali? And, and what, do you, what do you think makes your training camp so special? You become known now for the place where people go, not just to learn, but to hit lifetime PBs. And it's, it's fun. There's a social element to it. What do you think makes your training camp so special? Yeah, it's a, let, let's talk about it from two sides. Because I think from, for me, one of the things with Olympic weightlifting um, as a sport, it's a very isolated sport. And if you love weightlifting, you're kind of a little bit of a weirder, to be honest, if you've got that itch that you love going in and smashing barbells. The whole goal about the training camp is to bring people from all over the world that share the same passion, that same weirdness, and you bring them together and then they thrive. But the types of clients that, that I work with from a, from a personal standpoint and with our most elite level of coaching at Olympic Way, I think get invited from the lifting zone that get invited to these camps. Everyone is a high flyer outside of what they do in Olympic weightlifting, which is really cool. And that's a really special thing when you sit 20 people around a table to, to eat that all share a passion for weightlifting, but are all extremely talented in what they do outside of weightlifting. And I think that that is an amazing element to what we do uh, in our training camps. The depth of teaching that you can go into over a training camp is obviously extremely fast. You know, over the period of five physical days in, in person, it's great. But every single person, again, that's coming on that camp has been and worked with us online. And everything that I do, and I always say this to people when, um, for example, on their new client that's coming in, they go, are we going to get any impersonal time? I always say, even if you live next door to me, I would not teach you in person because else then you're going to become reliant on me in order to perform. So what we do with our clients online is we teach them and educate them so they have the knowledge and the power to not need us. They stay because they want to be a part of what we have. Okay, And that's why we do the camps and that's why they're so good. I also know Bali very well. So if people see the best part of Bali when they come with me and they take, I take all the thinking out of it. Okay? From a business standpoint, because again, there might be some, I actually spoke to a guy in Dubai who was asking about this the, the other day. The value in having something like a retreat or a training camp more than anything is to build retention. If you've got someone that's coming in in January and you've got them for a three-month period and they get to the end of that three-month period and they don't know what their next step is, the next step in the journey is people will get to a point where they feel like they've learned everything that they need to learn. You put great community events in over the period of a calendar that extends massively someone's lifetime value for, for me as a client, but their commitment to the program long term. It means that you can goal set with someone a year in advance, two years in advance. I have people that come in and go, in two years time, I want to be in a position where I feel confident enough to come to one of your training camps in Bali. Because they see that then as something that they want to work towards. And that was, it's very difficult to do in weightlifting outside of that, especially when we have such a global market, but putting the camps in place, give people those things to look forward to. So that is gold for PTs and coaches listening. All right, last bit, coming to uh, the next couple of weeks, I know you're having a little um, planned break next week, but going back to the ban, it gets lifted in a couple of weeks, right? Seven long fucking years. Anything going to change in the way you do things? Do you know what? Um, I've kind of avoided that one, uh, that uh, thought process, I guess, or to really sit with how that's sitting with me because it's been so long and I haven't really, I'm not in the right place right now to need to unpack that um, in terms of the impact of what's going to happen after the four weeks. But the thing that I keep asking myself is, am I going to provide any further benefit by going back to compete? Probably not. So probably at the moment, because like I said, I'm not 100% sure of that. If I felt that there was value that I could add further by entering back into that realm, then I would do it. But right now, when I think about that very shallowly, probably not. And that's probably the most important thing. The only thing that it changes is more people become able to socialize with me and learn from my team and, and my philosophy, which is going to be great because we're going to have even more people um, that are going to be able to, to join our team and grow. But when I think about, again, coming back to my real core mission statement of changing the way that people perceive Olympic weightlifting, I don't feel the current competitive structure of Olympic weightlifting is that. 
And I feel like if I keep treading the path that I'm on, and I've always had this dream of changing the way that weightlifting is competed in to make it fun and exciting, and it probably will be my last, last legacy. But I think if I keep walking towards that path, I'll provide a space where people will be able to compete in Olympic weightlifting in a much more enjoyable environment um, than the, the classical style of Olympic weightlifting. I think it's such a worthy mission. You, um, you mentioned to me before we started that you're potentially moving away from Australia to, to go on a, a bit of a nomadic year. Uh, why? Um, great. Well, we might as well, we might as well air it here now. <laughs> <laughs> Only about like, this is something that, you know, I sat, I sat with myself after my time in, in Bali and, and Dubai and I'm in probably the happiest feelings or point of my life that I've been in for a very long time. And I said to you earlier, like if something's making you feel a certain way, like lean into it. Like don't shy away from it. And for me, I think the travel and the experiencing new things and the being around new people, I'm gaining a lot for from a personal standpoint. I have the luxury in my life where I can do what I do from anywhere in the world. And um, that's really what stemmed this. And I rang up um, Crispy, who's one of my best friends, and I spoke to Jeff about it. And, you know, everyone sort of said, Look, I think this will be really good for you at this point of your life. Um, and... You know, I don't want to ever look back at points in, in my life when I'm grey and old and smoking cigars, going, oh, I wish I had had the balls to go and go and do that. Because, again, it comes back to like what we were saying, like, what's the worst that can happen? That nomadic period of my life or potentially this next year, even if it's a year or if it's two, it's going to provide so much more opportunity for me to do everything that's important to me right now. And that's exciting. And that's what's making me go, well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah, so sick. I think, mate, you're like I said, you're you're someone. If if anyone, like a young coach or yeah, a young coach that's looking to to particularly adopt that online world, but do things the right way through real education, through making a difference, through bringing together communities. If they're ever to model behaviour, I think you're someone that that people should certainly look up to and um, try and connect with. I've taken a huge amount of value from the seminars that we've, uh, I've been to. Um, I know we're going to do one tomorrow night at March on Stratford, which I'm incredibly excited for the, the March on community getting exposure to yourself. Um, the, the times I've sat with you and Jeff and also the times that we've spent on, on WhatsApp and, um, sharing notes and, and yeah, I guess just giving each other words of wisdom when the time's right. Uh, I look forward to watching this next next year unfold and I'll try and get to Bali. <laughs> this could be my excuse to get away to Bali for one of your seminars. But I appreciate you coming on, mate. I know it's been a, uh, a busy time for you whilst you're back in the UK. And um, yeah, it means a lot. Uh, thank you. Good man, Sonny. Thanks.